Before we take a look at the concept of the orchard of the future, maybe I'll cover how we got to where we are. Sebastian Saw and I, a couple of years ago, started brainstorming and, and thinking over this idea of what the orchard of the future may look like. And we really started to give that a lot of thought and looked at the research that we'd done, the projects we're working on, thought through the challenges our growers have. Um, and we really started to build a plan on how we would look at the orchard of the future, what kind of research we need to put in place, and start down this path. Um, our, our current uh, research portfolio in irrigation has really been crafted through those early conversations where we're looking at ETA very closely. We're looking at sensors and variable rate irrigation, plant-based sensors. Um, that really came out of these early conversations. This, this last fall, we started to talk, what parts are we missing? And we really realized that the beginning of the irrigation starts at the irrigation design level. And we've been looking at the growers up to that point as helping us solve these problems. But we realized that we needed to bring industry and we needed to really bring the design community into the conversation. So that was what really brought about having the irrigation summit. So you, as our guests, were really hoping that that you get to, to look at what our thoughts are. We get to share with you um, some current um, research that's going on in the area and that you walk away thinking through thoughts of how you could come back and help the industry improve on irrigation design and, and bring us to the point of having the, the best um, irrigation design and the best orchard of the future. Over the last year or so, I've been out asking irrigation designers across the state how they determine how to set up their irrigation design. What are the key things that they have to look at? What answers do they have to solve for to start off their irrigation design? And I came away with two universal things that were very common when answering this question, asking this question. So the two key things looked at, the two key factors was first, looking at what the maximum ET was um, for that area, how much the trees are gonna need for water, what the maximum ev evapotranspiration is, and secondly, um, how much water is available at the water source. Over the last decade or so, um, we've really added another factor to this list. Now we're really starting to look at soil texture and understanding what amount of water is available in different sections of an orchard. And in many orchards, it's not even, and we know that. Um, but we haven't really been able to tackle this until we've had new tools like variable frequency drives that really help us irrigate dissimilar sized blocks. Now that we've got some tools, we can jump into this a little bit more. This is an area that Isaiah Kaseka is gonna speak about later in the talk when he talks about variable rate irrigation but this is really letting us target regions of the orchard um, with the amount of water that we supply to them. And in the last few years, there's been really major advancements in different field technologies from aerial imagery, an aerial imagery that has data behind it that um, is interpreted and makes sense to growers. Um, so moisture probes have been common, but they've really brought on more insight um, and plant-based sensors that are measuring plant stress is a whole new area that are really helping us understand more what's going on in the orchard, identify weak points and strong points. That's really helping us refine our irrigation decisions. This has been really exciting. It's really given us some new tool sets um, as we go through the design process of when we look at um, an orchard, what to do with it, how to set it up, um, and how to manage it. Um, but it is a place where there's still a big need for a connection between the sensors and intelligence in the software to help us make controlled decisions based on this information. And this is an area that we really look to more advancement where that interconnection is made between the sensor data and the software control platforms. Um, our hope is that soon a grower um, not only will get information when to irrigate next, but it will actually commit an instruction set to the controller so the grower doesn't have to do that. Um, and then they can just execute it. 
um, because that's a big time um, process for a, a grower to go through. So we're looking forward to development there and we think this is an area that is really important to interpret the data coming off these systems. So the next step in this evolution um, that we're looking at from a research perspective is we, we've we're breaking fields up and variable rate irrigation systems that are designed around soil textures. Where do we go next? And and our thought is to look at much higher density, gridding an orchard out where we can control it in small blocks that at the start, um, we may actually irrigate to soil texture when we first plant, but then we start looking at tree vigor from aerial imagery data and infield sensors. And we may switch up how that um, those blocks are broken up. So having a grid of control allows us to restructure the layout of that. And it may be small changes, but it could be important changes. And it's an area that we're excited to do some research in and see at what level we can take this and what level of density um, is going to give us the best impact based on the cost. And it's always a cost thing. So but this is an area that we're starting to look at. We're starting to, to put research thought in. And we see in the future that this could be a really strong and beneficial way to look at how we break up our irrigation sets. This, this concept of this high flexibility in design, this gridded approach to breaking up the irrigation has, has a lot of benefits. Um, during times like frost events, if you know that you have low-lying areas, you could actually run irrigation only in those areas if you were short on water. Um, during the growing season, you may want to increase irrigation to one section in the field. That's different than you did earlier in the season. Um, you may at harvest time want to manage your irrigation. But the key to this is this integration of the software. And this is, goes back to that point that I made in a previous slide that this, this is going to put a lot more weight and importance on the power of intelligence from the field. This pulling in sensor data, having good, strong understanding of what's happening in the field, and then processing it and putting back control instructions to a controller. Um, a small grower could manage this on their own if they had one orchard. But when we've got growers that have multiple orchards and may end up having 100, 200, 300 irrigation sets, they can't manage this manually. So we really need to look at um, strong intelligence using machine learning or AI to help drive the controller. And essentially the grower would just need to execute on the recommendation, but they wouldn't have to input all the different irrigation commands. Our focus of going back to the design level when looking at irrigation efficiency is really being driven by reaching this goal of improving our water use efficiency and our nutrient application efficiency um, through very precise application of, of both. Um, with that in mind, um, we took this to our irrigation work group to develop a strategic research plan in this area. This irrigation plan evolved into the latest request for proposals and the recent selection and awarding of our projects. Um, so you'll see in our, uh, in our portfolio of research for this year, projects that tie directly into this, where we're looking at plant-based sensors, where we're looking at variable rate irrigation, a lot of work into looking at ETA to help us determine when, answer these questions, how much, when, where, and how. We have four building blocks that will significantly help us navigate this journey to the orchard of the future. Priority one, aims to advance our ability to sense tree water status through tree sensors. So we can really refine the when to irrigate question. The second priority aims to wrap up the years of discovery around ETC and KC, and then further move to ETA. And we'll learn more about ETA later in the presentations. We think that developing the right algorithms to measure ETA in almond orchards will literally allow us to account for how much a tree is transpiring and to polish the how, to, how much to irrigate question. 
The third priority will help us as we answer the where to irrigate question. By developing the ability to predict at a high resolution how much yield our orchards will produce each year, and then where are the areas in the orchard of low yield versus high yield. The fourth priority aims to integrate these blocks of knowledge so that the future irrigation design and operation decisions are easy to run. While behind the scenes, there's a significant bodies of knowledge solving this, this simple question, this simple answer. Thus, the future almond orchard will be irrigated depending on how much water is demanded by the tree, when that demand occurs across the season, and finally, where that demand occurs in the orchard. Working among these, between these lines, we will solve for the right rate, the right time, and the right place for the irrigation management equation. As we look at this orchard of the future, there's other things to consider um, other than the irrigation system itself. And these are things that are going to impact um, how we lay out our fields, our orchards, and the irrigation system. So a, a few things, Irrigated, irrigating by variety. This has become a common practice in some areas. Um, in Australia, this is a common practice where we can turn our irrigation on and off by variety. So while we're harvesting, we can irrigate other blocks, or if we find that some varieties yield higher, higher we may want to irrigate more. Having buffer zones. Um, there's a lot of work being done with robotic equipment um, and with off-ground harvesting where equipment's larger. So allowing buffer zones at the end of rows may be a mandatory thing, may be needed. Storage reservoirs are becoming much more common. So accommodating space for storage reservoirs and thinking through if there's a future reservoir installed, how is that going to be plumbed into the existing irrigation system? Pollination habitats. This is an area, you see this a lot, where there's a decision made, oh, we need to put some habitat in and we'll just steal some water off the end row. But thinking that through at the point of design that we've designed that in rather than that being an afterthought. And then the ability to do recharge, flooding the field during the dormant season. So that may be a consideration design time if, if you're designing a field that already has an existing flood infrastructure in place of leaving that in place, thinking that through, could we flood this block? Is this soil a soil that would benefit from recharge and work for being a recharge area? And then alternative energy space, S solar panel arrays take a lot of room. So factoring that in. So that's a few things that um, are just physical constraints that may impact an irrigation design. And then thinking through irrigation types. Um, these first three are pretty common. It's, it's probably the most common types of irrigation that we do in almonds right now. Solid set sprinklers. I'm, I live in the North State. This is a very common thing in the North State where frost protections are real concerns. So it's got benefits in that. But as we look at doing more cover crop in the field, um, solid sets really help with extending the life of a cover crop. Micro irrigation systems, they allow us to use less pressure. When we look at efficiency and energy costs, that's a benefit, um, supporting doing fertigation through the system. They do have higher maintenance costs though. That's something to think for a grower. Um, are they in a, in a place where there's going to be a lot of rodent? problems, thinking that through, is that the best bet? Or should we look at a solid set or a buried um, system to get that hose out of harm's way? And then drip systems, single double line are becoming really common. And that low pressure requirements a benefit. Same thing with the micro having fertigation, um, but again, higher maintenance. In the previous slide, we looked at some common systems, but here we're going to look at some kind of new thoughts. The first one we're starting to see quite a bit of already, dual systems using drip and micro or drip and solid set. Um, different reasons for this. Um, so you can irrigate during harvest um, for better frost protection to extend the life of cover crops. So um, the thing about dual line, um, dual systems is different regions of the state have different reasons for using a dual system. 
Another area we're starting to see a lot of interest is in is going back to looking at subsurface drip. And this is something that years ago was looked at. We kind of moved away from it um, of using subsurface drip. Um, in the old days, it was the thought was to cut down in evaporation. Now it's really around getting the tubing out of harm's way, away from equipment. There's a lot of equipment in the field and to cut down maintenance from rodent damage and uh, damage to the tubing. This would be a much shallower depth than we did in the past. And then I think we're going to see this from the presentation in Spain, the thought of using a third um, drip line just to expand the wetted area in certain soils. So these are just some new directions that I think are worth us as an industry looking at. I mentioned both of these previously um, in earlier slides, but just to highlight it again, there's a greater use of cover crop and a big emphasis on the use of cover crop to really help um, soil infiltration, um, soil water holding capacity, and soil health um, for a bee habitat. So you're going to see a lot more use of cover crop across the state in regions where it's appropriate to irrigate the centers. Um, so having systems that can keep that cover crop going late, later in the season. Um, in some regions, this would only be planted in the, in the fall and we would use winter rains to get it started. But in areas where we could irrigate it um, and keep it growing later in the season, it's going to help with this soil health. And then off ground harvesting. There's a big move to off ground harvest from a, from a production standpoint. It allows a number of things that are beneficial at harvest time, but it does impact orchard structure. Um, so that's an area that you're going to see a lot more work coming from the almond board. There's going to be a lot more interest in this area. So we should be aware of what are the impacts of, of um, off ground harvesting. One I mentioned earlier, these larger churn radius is at the end rows because these machines are quite large. I hope you've walked away with some good ideas that um, came out of this talk on the orchard of the future. In the state of California, water is always going to be a critical resource for us and finding new ways to be efficient with it, be more efficient with it, will be a challenge that we will always have. Um, and it's a challenge that will take the whole industry to help solve. So um, I, I hope you found value in this and, and please share, please come back and share ideas that you're experiencing when you work with growers. Um, I, I look forward to the next few um, presentations. I think um, everyone will very much enjoy the presentations looking at how design's done in other parts of the world, as well as the presentations on current research that's going on. And lastly, with the UC Merced um, presentation. So with that, thank you. And we'll go to the next section.